here. What's up, guys? And we're doing uh, another part of our series, talking to some of the top collectors in Yu-Gi-Oh! in the world. And to be on this list, um, you couldn't have anybody other than Tony here. Uh, this is Tony, a.k.a. Gezi underscore TCG. This guy is someone who I compared to SM Pratt to Pokemon. Gezi is to Yu-Gi-Oh! And that is a uh, pretty big title to say, but I, I would say, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Talk to me, Tony. What? Hey, so, I, I don't know if I'm really all that, but I, I certainly appreciate it. So it's pretty dope for you to say all that. Um, you know, it all, it all means uh, quite a bit. So I, I enjoy my involvement around here. So um, I'll just say hi to everyone. I think, you know, most of the people are going to know what I do. So. Heck yeah. Um, Gezi, you've been in the community, what would you say, and uh, at least Instagram-wise, last four or five years, even more? Uh, yeah, about four. So I think I first started my Instagram in like 16. I think it was late 16 because I was at Fort Sill. So um, I, yeah, maybe early 17. That first started, well, I came back to Yu-Gi-Oh earlier than that, but Instagram for me kind of developed around uh, 16, late 16, early 17. So a little, like maybe maybe just four years, so. Four years. That's still a pretty good tenure for something that I uh, feel like has grown over the last um, couple of years extremely as well, you know, for the community. Um, so first off, let's, let's jump into this interview. What would you say, uh, what got you started into Yu-Gi-Oh? Um, well, I started playing in in August of 2002. I remember I remember when Jinzo came out. So um, Jinzo was like a big deal when it came out. It was like a forty dollar card back then, uh, which was a lot in 2002. Right. Um, My favorite card, by the way. This right. is before this is before tournament pack one. So um, Jinzo comes out. And a couple of my friends, you know, we, we'd all played Pokemon at uh, the local Toys R Us. And then my buddies got into Yu-Gi-Oh! And we didn't really understand the game. So there was like, we played no tribute. We didn't really play, play. You know, we just had a bunch of a fat deck of cards. And, you know, whatever we did is what we did. Right. There wasn't a whole lot of strategy to it for us. I mean, I remember getting uh, Magic Ruler blister packs at... Uh, at, at Walmart before Walmart super centers were like the big thing. Oh, wow. But my those... friend, the, answer, the short answer is my friends. <laughs> were those first edition blisters at Walmart or were they unlimited? Dude, I don't remember, man. <laughs> it was a long time ago. I remember the first, the first thing I did was I got a black illusion ritual. That was my first foil card. I pulled it out of a blister. So was it first edition? I don't know. It was 2002. So maybe, maybe not. You know, I was a kid. I was only like 12 or 13. So. But that was pretty I cool. That, that. I did. What's that? Oh, I was saying that, that was probably pretty, pretty nostalgic pulling that though, being your first hollow. <laughs> I don't know. I probably trashed that thing, man. I don't know where it is. <laughs> I don't have any of those things anymore. So, <laughs> um, what would you say is your your favorite card, and and why would you say that? Uh, uh, dude, uh, that's tough. So I I love. I'm a huge Jinzo fan. So I mean, you know, my whole whole profile image is Jinzo. So you know, I did I did bring a couple of cards. So I have my Jinzo here. I don't know if you can even really see it. Probably not because my thing isn't working, but I got a Jinzo with me. Um, so it's kind of hard to see it. Yeah, you can't see this giant blur, but I'm sorry. <laughs> it's blur, but it's probably a PSA 10, correct? It's a, yeah, so I have a 10 Jinzo and then I like Morphing Jar. So uh, I got a 10 Morphing Jar um, and I like that too. So, you know, and recently, recently I got a Crush Card in nine. I'm pretty stoked about my crush card. I can't oh, find it. Those are impossible to find, by the way. Those prize cards. Yeah, I got I got ripped on it, but um, it turns out it was a decent buy when I got it. So I'm pretty happy to just have one, and I'm, I'm hoping that it'll be really good trade bait for like a PSA 10 needle one day. Oh man, 
Yeah, that's I, I, that's the one I want. I want the crush card, man. Finding that in a PSA 10 though is. I saw three. Three. I know where they all are, dude. You'll you'll. It's fucking impossible, dude. That shit's pretty <laughs> hard. <laughs> oh yeah, that's man. So nostalgic of a card, though. I mean, Kaiba had it. You know, everybody wanted it for the show. Um, but speaking of like the market, uh, man, what is going on with this market lately? Have we just seen a? I mean, it, it's crazy. What What do you think? Is it because of this virus going on? Everyone's just bored at the house. What do you think? No, no, I don't think so. Um, it, <laughs> probably gonna get crucified in my chat because of this, but I think that um, I, I think that there's there's more for the market. So um, it's not uh, um, really it, it's hard it's hard to gauge. So you know, there's a lot of risk in all of this, right? Because it has a lot to do with how much free income people really have. Um, there's some speculation that goes on and then there is um collection collecting that goes on and, and sometimes those things are not mutually exclusive and you can be a speculator and you can be a collector at the same time so and plus it's a convenient excuse to to spend your money when i ask you you know why did you spend this money well i'm investing my money right so there's some of that you know so there, these things are not mutually exclusive the market has swung up recently. Uh, every time that I, I, I've been told, for like the, as long as I've been on Instagram, I've been told that the market is coming down, that the market is coming down, and this, this is a bubble, and you know we're going to see the big crashes coming, sell your cards now, buy back later. You know, and it never comes. So right. there's just adjustments everywhere. You know, and the only time you really see adjustments is when you've got um, a guy that grades a ton of stuff and then it constantly pops up back to back to back to back. And so um, that happened with a guy who graded like eight or nine corrected art, dark paladin, you know, and, and it saturated the market. Yeah, that, was about, that was about a year ago, wasn't it? I, I, I remember how long ago it was. Yeah, sure. Call it a year. Uh, the guy graded a bunch of corrected art paladins and, um, you know, he, he put them up back to back to back to back to back. So he didn't list them all at once for auction, but how many people are going to buy these things, you know, before, you know, can you afford all of the volume in this market in order to soak it all up? And so that sometimes affects the market. But every time, as soon as those cards are gone, that's it. The price is now asked. And so for a lot of these cards, um, the market has continued to swing up. And I think that this is not the end of the market swing. So the pendulum, I always hear, sell your card now, sell your card now. And, you know, many of these cards that people want to buy from you are the cards that you should keep. And so um, right. I've been told plenty of times, oh, take that, take that, take that. And it's like, I'm okay, I don't. I'm good. I don't need the money. So if anything, it's it's, it's very similar to. I mean, the you're not, you're never going to see it go down in, in in value. I don't see because the, the sealed boxes that once they're gone, they're gone. You know, well, they're not making product is a market. I think you know. So sealed product, graded cards, raw cards, meta is a part of the raw card market. So there's collectibles and then there's meta. Um, that's great and it's not meta because you can't play it so i mean and then you've got the sealed market so the sealed market is the safest market as long as interest remains sealed product remains harder and harder to get because you have a natural attrition for sealed product because people inevitably will open product inevitably i mean right. until there's one or none left or whatever you know and there are some there are more of some than others but i mean even for graded cards you know, Yu-Gi-Oh has a remarkably low population relative to other trading card game markets, uh, especially for some of the cards that you would in Pokemon or Magic consider vintage or whatever. Um, and so you've got cards that remain population 10 and under. And so sometimes people say, oh, that's because nobody is grading them. Oh, that's because nobody's grading them. You know, so... You know, sometimes it is because, you know, there aren't a lot of them are, that are graded, but I try to look at the, the yield percentage. And so the rate of a 10 hit for things like injection as a case study, say, so you always, 
I have watched injection prices and population for the last three years. And injection has remained between 11 and 17 or 18 or 20 percent a yield rate. And so injection doesn't vary very much in that realm. And so you can safely assume that no matter how many are sub, even a thousand or so, about 15 to 20 percent of all of those will only be 10. Only 15 to 20 percent of those will be PSA 10 injection ferry lilies. You see what I mean? Yeah, the, um, the ratios are, no matter how many times they're going to grade, they're, they're, do you think that's PSA or in general them doing that on purpose? Or do you think it's just that's just how the cards are? You're talking about rare air. <laughs> you're, you're talking about artificial scarcity. So, um, so for some of these things, uh, I don't think that PSA undergrades cards to protect their tens. Um, more more than they actually grade the card to protect their the, the genuine nature of giving a 10. There are always outliers where you'll see places like Beckett or PSA grade a card that deserves to be a nine, a 10, or or the reverse where you grade a card and not a nine, but it actually deserves to be a 10. Um, you know, so it goes both ways and across the board. So it's not mutual, it's not exclusive to say PSA or whatever. Any grading company is going to have that issue because it's subjective. So you're defined by the limits of human ability, right, which are not always great. And so you will, sometimes people are tired. Sometimes people, you know, grade cards ineffectively. So I don't think that PSA protects their grades any more than any other grading service or that they protect their grades at all any more than they would just protect the, the authenticity of giving that grade to a card. And so if a guy said, I don't think this card is a 10, is he protecting, is he grade protecting or is he actually saying, I don't feel comfortable giving this a 10? You see what I mean? So the difference is minute maybe, so. Well, I never thought Does of that. Does that answer your question? I don't know if that answers your question or not. It answered it pretty, good, pretty well. Um, another thing on the market, like, uh, I mean, you saw the that LLB box. So what was it? The, the Just, recent one for PWCC, right? Yeah, that one sold for twelve thousand one hundred uh, auction wise. The Glossy First Ed. What do you think of that price? I mean, sealed market. Sealed market is its own market. So you know, you're never gonna bust that box and and make that money back without without like a ton of luck. So I mean, you'd have to get good ultras. You'd have to get a secret. You know, you'd have to grade the commons and the rares, and they'd have to do well. Um, but Legend of Blue Eyes was printed well, so it's not incredibly hard to do that. But you know, you're gonna, you, it's gonna cost you a ton of money to grade commons and rares and stuff like that. So you know, there are people who say, oh, it's not worth that much. You can't bust the box and get that money back. But sealed is its own market, and so people are willing to pay whatever they're willing to pay for the sealed product. So if a guy thought that. 12,500 plus tax if he lives in the US, you know, fine, you know, good, good for him. Is there a market above that? I mean, probably, I, like I said, I don't think that this is the peak. I don't think that the market crash is coming. I don't think it's COVID related. I think people have more money to buy cards. Some people have more money to buy cards per se, but I, I've noticed that a lot of higher end, I don't know that I would call them collectors, um, but they, the higher end speculators have come into the market to buy cards because when you make, let's say I made $500,000 on stock options, right? Okay. Today. Yeah. Last month, just call it last month or even a hundred thousand dollars. Right. So if, if I feel like I already have a pretty st- stable position in the market you know i've got a hundred thousand dollars that i need to do something with so what do you do with it do you buy gold silver do you buy art like do you what do you invest your money in and so for some people who are looking back who are far more well off than people like me you know and, and i do pretty good myself you know these guys are looking back and saying well you know the card market is doing pretty good and they're looking at baseball and sports markets and saying you know, there's a history here that pr- that proves that these markets can be sustainable and make me money if I make the right choices. And so they come to people like me sometimes and say, hey, what, what would you do with $100,000? What would you buy in Yu-Gi-Oh? 
And so $40,000 of sealed product will disappear in a day or whatever, you know. Well, that's crazy, especially with that. I mean, what was it in March? You could buy that box for 6800 and then now almost double in price. I, I bought that box in 2011 for $155. So, oh, my God. Whatever. Five bucks, huh? Bro, and I was broke as a joke. And I still found $150 to buy that box. The guy had 12. He had, well, 11. I mean, he had 11. So he had a whole case of LOB. Lossy. Oh, my gosh. Wish, wish you'd have picked up those now, right? <laughs> I mean, it's all water, man. You know? What are you going to do? Yeah. I, I, I had thought, a time machine. I thought I got a good deal when I picked up my, my wavy box for 4000 um, a few years ago. I thought that was a steal of the deal. But $155, I don't. I don't think I could top that one. <laughs> That's pretty good, right? That's, That's pretty, pretty sick, man. 2011, huh? Yeah, April. April of 11. Wow. Just thinking, a decade ago, you could get pennies on the dollar on the stuff now. It's crazy. Not even. Yeah, nine years ago. Yep. 150 yeah. bucks. Yep. They they had um they were there was a guy with a warehouse full of 36 pack boxes of MRL and Ferro Servant. And he was selling them for sixty dollars a, a box. Oh my gosh! Sixty a box, yeah. Um, kind of swinging off topic on that, since we're talking about the boxes. Um, the Tune Chaos. Do you do you feel like uh like the cases, for instance? Like um, I've been thinking, wouldn't it be a smart investment right now to pick up some of the cases on that, especially with how the pre-orders went and they already doubled the price in a, a week? Do you it see? It depends that? on. It depends on you know how long you want to hold on to it. Um, it, it is a they did re release collector rares in there, so there's some claim to fame there. Um, there's some speculation about whether or not it was short printed. Um, there's already confirmed unlimited coming sometime in August or September, so I don't know that there's going to be another print run. So whatever is out there is out there. Theoretically, I mean, I don't know. They could always print more. But I've got my case. I mean, you probably saw I put a video up on it, but um, yeah, I, saw that. I don't really want to open my case. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't really understand all of the new meta stuff. And but yeah, there's chaos and tunes and shit. I, I wanted, I wanted more tunes. I wanted, wanted more tunes. Yeah, I was hoping there'd be more tunes, and that was the only disappointment. I, I don't think it's a bad buy. I just think you're gonna have to sit on it for a couple of years, like five or or more. You know, so the reality is that, um, so if you looked at ghosts as a case study for what new rarities do, so you're you're looking at two new rarities that came out. Recently, you got Starlight Rares, which are the Prismatic Secrets, and you've got Collector Rares. Collector Rares are more, more common per box than Starlights, and the Starlights are coming in the booster sets, and Collector Rares are coming in the, um, um, like the side, I don't know what you call them, they're like the side sets, because Toon Chaos isn't technically a booster set, right? It's not like Eternity Code, uh, Eternity Code or uh, Chaos Impact or a rising rampage it's its own like kind of like a hidden summoners was or um a, a, an arsenal those sets that's kind of what toon chaos gets lumped into and so they've created this thing for those sets because those sets sold terror I mean, so that's what the collector is supposed to do it's supposed to bring those sets more uh popularity more revenue by producing some rarity in those sets so if you look, if you took those two different things that they're making, so you got Starlights and you got Collector Rares. If you take those and you look at Ghosts and Ultis, which they discontinued in TCG minus the OTS packs, um, those cards have only recently been um, become a lot more popular with collectors, especially PSA 10 versions of them. So. The uptrend that occurred for ultis and ghosts only happened recently, and the first release of the ghost rare was as far back as 2007. So you're looking like 13 years ago when these ghosts were first released in tech Tactical Evolution, and even further before that for ultis. That's how long it's taken for these cards to really, really take right. off in the right. sense that they are now surpassing classic cards in 10. 
by, by far. I mean, by far. So most, not all. I mean, obviously, blue eyes and red eyes and some of those cards are still contenders. But, um, you know, if you look, if you want to take the collectors and starlights then and push them forward, you would have to say, OK, if I buy them now and hold on to them in good shape or I grade them now or whatever, you know, I will have a better position when they do become more popular later on. The only caveat to that is back when Ghosts and Ultis first debuted in 04 and 07, no, nobody was grading cards. So nobody was busting these boxes and sending 20 Starlight to PSA right. as soon as the box came out. So a lot of these cards, even though they are more popular and will trend upward over the course of a long period of time should interest continue and they become more popular. In, in the Yu-Gi-Oh world and community, then there will be more available in 10, unlike the cards that were ultis and go. You see what I mean? Yeah. So, I, I there's think there's some difference in there and, and some similarity. Yeah. I, th I think, uh, I mean, the set is very, it's, you know, centered very well. It's got the iconic cards. They're, I mean, they look really good. Um, I mean, uh, the Black Luster Soldier looks really good. Um, it does look really cool. I'd like to have that one actually, but I, I think that might be a really good set to have though. Keeping that a sealed case would, would not be, uh, I think that'd be a very smart idea. People out there who's, who's investing in Yu-Gi-Oh, that specific case would be, it's very sought after. I've seen six cases in the last two days on eBay. So yeah, I mean, it, it's a, it's a popular set. I don't have a reason to open it up in my, I really don't want to, uh, a harpy, a tune harpy lady. That'd be my favorite card out of the set, probably. Collector rare, of course. I don't have one. I'm too poor. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's uh, that's a cool set. I'm pretty excited. I'm gonna open one of those up this weekend. I haven't got to do one yet, so. A hopefully. case or a box? Uh, we'll start with a just a box, and then I, I might do a case. I haven't decided. Right. You know, I had to. <laughs> um, so let's uh, let's jump into another question. I want to get into um, something huge. I feel like in our community is with people getting scammed. You hear it uh -huh. all the time: scammers, this and that. There's even a, a you know a, someone on Instagram that you know scammer dungeon goes after the scammers and like it's yeah. it's is it's, that guy still around? I don't even know if that guy's still around. He's he's still around. It's, I mean, I I watch his feed now and then, but it's it's always interesting to see the what's all going on in the scamming world. But, but there, was, uh, uh, there was a verified trust your trader kind of deal for a while too. I don't know if you were around for that. Um, there were a couple of people who had this like joint account that they managed on Instagram, and and they like would give you the stamp of approval. And then you were this verified trusted trader or some shit like that. It was a neat concept. I mean, I appreciated it. You know, I never got it because I never made a fucking ref page. And they were like, in order to get it, you have to make a ref page. I'm like, I'm not making a fucking ref page. Y'all can suck it. <laughs> so, but they, um, they were cool. I mean, they were decent dudes and they, you know, I mean, we didn't <laughs> always agree, but right. know, they, they did God's work when they needed to here and there, you know, so. Um, so, I'm sorry. What your your question about scammers? What is it? It was pretty much. Um, I mean, for you know what's going on in the community, the the biggest one that you hear of the name is Jacob Bowman. I'm sure that that's name. That's my man. Is, that's my <laughs> man, boy. He uh, yeah. he, man, he has scammed so many people. Tell me what what can I'd say? The biggest thing is I, I feel like people are clueless. What do you think buyers and sellers can do to protect what? themselves? These what are the rules? What am I allowed to? What am I allowed to say on here? I, I guess I have to be like kind of nice. Um, so people like that some people your opinion. Like, if, if you if you um if you get scammed and you don't go scam if you scammed is not the right word if somebody steals from you right using mail fraud and you don't go to the police you're weak you're screwing yourself. You know, you're you're a victim of your own laziness and we that's <laughs> and that's those are harsh words, I think. You know, it's hard because some people don't want to go to the cops and be like, I collect Yu-Gi-Oh cards and I got robbed. 
you know? Like, <laughs> I I get it. It's not, like, very cool, you know? But right. the reality is that if you don't do anything, if you do, if you do get scammed, if you do get stolen from via mail, if you send first and nobody sends anything back for you, which is terribly dumb, but, you know, if you do that and you get robbed, you know, and you don't go to the police, it is your fault. If you're international and you do it, you are screwed, man. You are SOL, man. You're, you're shit out of luck. That is it, dude. There's no, the Irish police are not going to go bust this dude's door down or whatever in Ireland or the UK or in France or Siberia or whatever. So would so, you, would you always recommend goods and services then? I mean, in, unless, Unless you know the guy, like, yeah, goods and services is the way to go. You know, if, if it's under, like, 50 bucks, if it's under $10, like, if a guy's willing to burn his account for $10 or less, probably low IQ, you know? But right. it, people do it. You know, it happens. It doesn't happen to me, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. I think that the safest methods are don't send first, find a middleman, Pay goods and services, right? And if your deal is big, like a big deal, like if you're doing like over five hundred dollars or over or over ten thousand dollars, dude, please find a middleman, dude. I middle for people all the time. Um, it's it's no problem. You know, find somebody who will middle for you. You can do the trade properly. If if people don't want to send first, don't trade. That that's a that's a big indicator of I am trying to scam you. Sending at the same time is it's fucking bullshit, man. It is like, it is the dumbest shit ever, man. <laughs> People are like, oh, we can send it at the same time. Like, what does that do? It doesn't do anything. <laughs> I'll, I'll send you $1,000 on PayPal that you can hold. It's like, you can just charge it back on your credit card. You know, that doesn't mean anything. Right. So PayPal is in like a 90 day window. So like, you know, this sends you a thousand dollars on his card and, and then you send him the thing he never sends you anything and charges back his thousand dollars you got robbed like it happens people can do that if i can think of it it's very possible people and just need to be more people who are way better at scamming than i am <laughs> there's just there's, there's so many of them out there you just got to be careful um yes. people need to be more vigilant about not only who they do business with you know, if you're not sure about somebody, I would say definitely ask for a reference. Who who's bought or sold from him before? Man, more. Jacob Bowman is the master, man. That guy's got all like ref accounts for days, dude. Like that guy's wild, dude. He just spends his time, dude. He's like he must spend like weeks on end. Like I'm gonna scam somebody. I'm gonna make five hundred dollars like in a week. You know, he probably maps it all out. Like if he makes, you know, if he scams enough people in a month, like he makes an extra two grand or some shit like that. So like it takes him however long to make fake refs accounts. And I remember he was he was actually refing himself with his fake ref accounts who had like 50 followers. And you could see like that they didn't have like a lot of followers. So there were like some indicators that his refs were bad. And they were like brand new accounts that he created to ref himself so he could get guys to send first. Oh my gosh. Wow. Fucking wild. Right? Isn't that wild? It's true, dude. It's That's true. a lot of time. You can do it, dude. It's not, be done. Only, it's not only wrong, it's uh, he has so much time on his hands. It's like, oh my god. It's it's psychotic, dude. That guy is mental, dude. I promise you, dude. Like there are some mental people around Instagram, but that guy is like hard like I, I really dislike some people on Instagram, but I don't dislike anybody more than I dislike that guy. Really? Well, that guy, go ahead that guy deserves to step on every Lego in the whole in the whole planet, dude. All at once, dude. Across every universe, dude. He deserves that. All, all of him. Even the ones that are good, dude. I'll um since you went on to that disliking subject, I'll uh I'll scroll down to a, a different question. Who would you say is the most liked and the most disliked person in the Yu-Gi-Oh community and why? So is this one right? person that's liked and disliked? Yeah, well, who would you say is the most popular or the most liked? Like people like them because of this reason why? And who would you say is the most disliked and this reason why? And I hope I'm not oh, on the other one. <laughs> these are two people. Yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, so I pick somebody who's liked and pick somebody who's disliked. I thought you were trying to get me to say like, this person is liked by a lot of people, also hated by a lot of people. 
No, no, no. Just one, one, one person each. Who, who's the most liked in the community? Who's the most disliked in the community? And your reasons why? No. Should be really juicy, guys. I hope you guys liked it. Because <laughs> I'm the most liked. I think Ian, old school expert, is probably the most respected guy around. That's the easy. That's the easy question, right? That's the easy mm -hmm. question. Who's the most disliked? By far, the most. The person who gets the most. Well, let me think. Like in my chat, who who gets talked? Who do they talk shit about the most? They talk well, shit about. <laughs> it just depends, like, because sometimes, like, you know, it's like it's it's like gender neutral in there, man. They don't know who the hell these people are on eBay. They'll just throw out the thing and be like, "Who the fuck is this?" And I'll be like. Right. Who's the most? There's, there's got to be somebody that sticks out that's just like, oh my gosh, this either either they're a troll or they're just they're they're just you know it's somebody, some somebody just sticks out in your head. <laughs> Who did I block? Oh, dude, I will tell you, dude. Um, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh Empire, yeah, Sebastian Kara, that guy, dude, bro. <laughs> Uh, dude, that that guy. I don't know, man. Like, we didn't really. I don't really dislike anybody, man. Like, I don't know. I'm trying to think about who did I block. Who did I block? I blocked a, a couple of people that I were like, uh, I can't remember, dude. I'm not a bean counter, man. Let me look. Let me <laughs> let me look. Man, I blocked a couple of people, but I I don't think that I like. Um, yeah, you say that you say that guy's name though. Um, I've seen he trolls you pretty hard now and then. I've seen I've seen this stuff. It on. Was, it wasn't personal. It wasn't personal. In fact, I didn't really even mind the guy until he started calling like where people worked and shit. And that that's when like uh, that that's when it got like it turned You're into a big deal. Blocked accounts. All right, let's see, dude. Be car. Yep, for sure. Percent. Oh, oh, dude, this guy. Yep, hundred percent. Yep, him for sure. Uh, what's his name? Tyson, dude. Uh, Raja Hussein, no, no. do you remember? No. What that? Yeah. Bro, that guy is a fucking scammer. Bro, <laughs> he is a liar and he's a scammer, dude. 100%. 100 fucking percent, dude. That guy sucks. That guy scammed a guy on eBay, not knowing that he was on Instagram. Card Trader? Out of a dark Crisis box. Yeah, that was, that was Card Trader, wasn't it? Oh, uh, I think so, yeah. Card Trader won. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That guy. So he sent I him. I remember a, that. Dude. And then he sent him back an open box and claimed that it was his girlfriend that. that oh, uh, yeah. Accident. 100%. Fucking liar, dude. 100%. <laughs> yep. My, my with him my was, girl, I tripped and I opened the box and all the packs and it was an accident. <laughs> a long my, time ago, before, I, I don't know if you were around for this, but there was this guy who had an account called Yu Gi Oh! Official. I'm looking at all my block lists. Okay. So Yu-Gi-Oh! Official bought a bunch of subs and shit. So he looked like super legit. And for a while he was. I mean, he used to sell and everything. And then it, it came out that he scammed like everybody. He scammed a bunch of people all at once. Mm -hmm. um, and then he came back and apologized for it. And then he went away forever. Everybody blocked him. Wow. And then, oh, wait, I do remember that. I do remember that. That was, yeah, that was yeah. crazy. Go ahead. It was a long. That was a long time ago. That was like two years ago or longer, maybe even three years ago. Um, there's another guy, um, uh, Spellcaster Circle, Ethan Swanson. Yeah, and he the guy that like cracked open the the blue eyes. Yeah. Yeah. It was so tough. He cracked it with his bare hands. Yeah, because it didn't deserve a ten, dude. And <laughs> man, we forever, we forever laughed at that guy, man. Forever, dude. Forever, ever, dude. Never forget that guy. That was wild, dude. Well, what's crazy, wild, man, like, even if he didn't think that the, the card deserved a 10, that was not his place to do that to that person's yeah. card. Any, anytime anybody gets a card that they're like, this should have been a 10, but it got a whatever, I always, we always say, that's because Ethan Swanson sits at the end of the uh, quality assurance desk at PSA. He gave you a PSA 9. <laughs> oh, man. I hate to be known as that in the community. <laughs> <laughs> it's super, it's super, dude. That's why I say like we never forget that guy. Never ever, dude. Right. Never ever ever. Never ever. I'm waiting on the meme. I want to see the memes on uh, <laughs> on Google for it. Dude, it's it's good, dude. Let me see if I can find somebody else, dude. But um, we we uh, rag on a couple of people. There was 
Um, Ghost Rare Hunter catches some hate um, for sure. Um, and then um, Dylan Powers catches some hate too. And then Omar, who you interviewed a yeah. long ago, also catches some hate. Uh, you know, it, I think and Cardhouse, Cardhouse um, does too. So, but I'm I'm kind of I'm kind of friends with all these people. You know, the last four that I mentioned. Um, no, it's crazy. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't have any issues. With them. Some people take it personally. I, I don't think I understand that there's you know two pieces of the market, right? So there are buyers and sellers, right? And that's again not mutually exclusive. You know, these guys a lot of times are the generating force in the market. And so people like Omar and Cardhouse and other people like them get a lot of hate for charging a lot for their cards. But, you know, these are guys who make who put bread on the table by selling these cards. And so I think that it's, it's somewhat unfair because, you know, not only are they trying to make a living off of doing this, but they're also feeding the market, right? So these are people who are grading some of the hardest cards to get and selling them, you know, because if they were like me, they grade stuff that they needed to with nothing else and never sell a nickel, you know? Right. And that's, that's not, that's not helpful. It doesn't help produce a well-rounded uh, market with a lot of available product. Well, that makes sense. Um, there. What, uh, We'll change the subject again. What, um, because your collection is, we haven't even got over your collection yet. It's, it's really sick. I mean, I know it, but people don't know it. So it's like, I got like 600 PSA cards, man, something like that. Six like a little less. And all are PSA 10, right? No, well, not all of them. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Most of them, like 99%, maybe. And you're and you're working on your registry sets. How many of the first eleven sets do you have for the registry sets done? Done like complete, complete like commons and rares. Yeah. One. And, and that's the LOB. LOB. It's, it's hard, dude. It's hard. That doesn't include TP and stuff like that too, because I also do TP turn pack, um, which is by far like the yeah, most possible. Useful experience ever yeah if for someone like me you know who wants tens and there's like four needle worms in the world and i graded one and sold it and now i can't get another one <laughs> it's um so that brings up a good question what uh like with your collection uh what what would what's your uh goals for the end of the year for your collection and then what are your goals for the next five years for your collection oh man these are the hard question so like i'm torn because i don't want to be this like hoarder because like i, I have, a, have a wife you know <laughs> like there's got to be a place for, for this stuff like and i can't like you know tote all this shit around i, I move a lot you know I, I move a lot i move often um and for the next 13 or 15 years i will continue to move a lot and move often and it's hard to tote all this crap with me you know so my goal my goal I personally believe that goal setting is one of the most important things that people can do in their lives, right? Not just like when you collect, like, yes, goal setting is important when you collect, um, but in your life, like goal setting is like one of the greatest things that you can do because you need to know where you want to go. And then, you know, the line is not always linear, but your, your line, your plan should be linear. So, you know, then no plan survives first contact. That's the way it goes. Um, so, you know, one of the things that I want to do with my collection is complete registries. So registries are wildly annoying, um, consume a ton of time and energy, right? Because, you know, there's all seven stages. Are you familiar with the seven stages of grief, right? The very end is acceptance, right? When you're there, like you've accepted that you're finally almost done. You, you've gotten over it. Right. I've been through all seven stages of grief trying to put just one registry set together and all 243 foils and all 40 TP hollow. And I am not done yet. I'm not done. So the, it, it is the, the magnitude of difference to complete all of the 11 sets and eight Turner packs and screw with ultis and GX and stuff is just, it's enormous. So I don't know 
if my goals will, I, I'm assuming my goals will change as I go forward. But right now my goals are to complete the 11 sets and then and TP at least the foils. So there's 40 foils in TP and then there's are like 1,200 cards in the first 11 sets. Are you pretty close to getting them done? To, to no, I'm not even, I'm like 30% on some, like Pharaoh Servant and uh, I'm like 30%. Front Guardian and Legacy of Darkness. Um, Legacy of Darkness no is really tough. That. Legacy of Darkness is probably really tough because it's very off-centered. The foils are tough. The commons and rares are not terrible. Um, so the foils are the hardest part. I've got the foil set for Legacy of Darkness, and it took me, you know, a ton of time. Um, right. You know, going forward, I realized that. You know, there are some cards that you pick up when you get the opportunity to pick them up, or you risk waiting on another to come up and get or get graded, and then you're at the mercy of whomever graded it and is selling it. Um, I I had to deal with that with uh, Tyrant Dragon, which I passed up for you know 175, 250, 300, 350, and and 400, and ended up having to buy it for 600 dollars. So oh goodness, that's crazy. I guess that's, that's he crumbles. <laughs> many of them, you know. Uh, so it, it's a lot to consider that 1,200. You know, looking forward and saying, yes, I'm gonna have 1,200 damn cards in my house, and I'm just like that. That's <laughs> that's that's cool, man. That's that's very inspiring, though. I mean, I, I don't know. I've, I know maybe three or four collectors out there that even are working on their registry sets, let alone finish. So kudos to you, man. LLB. I think that would be so sick. I'd, I'd be looking at that all the time, seeing that that uh, registry set. I'm sure it's sick. <laughs> it's terrifying to have something like that, like even even pieces of it just sitting in your house. So. Oh man, I'd, <laughs> I'd be putting that in a storage unit for sure. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's just like that. I mean, some of the harder sets to grade are Invasion of Chaos, uh, Ancient Sanctuary. The later sets are hard because the print quality is terrible. Right. That makes sense. Do you ever see yourself ever selling your collection? I don't know, oh, man. Uh, I, I, I gauge the market sometimes just to see where it's at. Uh, you know, I, I've been asked, you know, to appraise my set to be like, if, if I'm going to sell the set, I've been asked by multiple people to just come to them and say, hey, I'm selling the set. Do you want to buy it? Um, so I know a couple of, like I said, some of these guys have like stupid money. So, you know, they're not, it's not that they don't want to buy the set, you know, or, or spend the money, you know, we just have to come to terms on what the value of the set is. Do I think I'm going to sell my sets? And it's just taken so long to do it. You know, like, I don't know that I could be compensated for the time. I'm, I'm a guy who understands the value of an investment right so you know it's a collection for me and i enjoy the collection i enjoy the work i do for psa that comes with the collection that i have and maintain the stock that i keep so that i can help psa and work through things with them um but i also you know it, it's hard to it's just a lot man it's a lot to right. it's just a lot to have it's hard to it's hard to let go of something, especially that means so much to you in your childhood and at that. Yeah, I know you spent a ton of time, time finding it. Together. I don't know if I could be compensated for the time that it took to build those sets because you know I I don't know. It just takes so long. It's so much work, you know. I know the um the first set or the base set first edition of uh, Pokemon sold the other day to Dave and Adams for 130,000, the whole registry set, the base set. Dave and, and Adams bought it. Yeah. Uh, the collector, I forgot the yeah. guy's name, but the I owner, know they are. I know but, uh, he, he bought that for 130,000 and I'm just seeing, I could, I'm imagining the day when I see the LLB registry set sell and it's somewhere crazy numbers like that. I think that, well, That'll be the day. I, I kind of I got off track a little bit, but you know when you have that kind of money, you know, in invested in something, right? Lit like literally invested in, not like you know you're buying stock like an investment, but that you've taken that money and put it into something. You know, if 
I were to sell the set, I would need to have something that I could put that into that was equally worthwhile, if that makes sense. You know, so I wanted to buy a house, or put a down payment on a house, or, um, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, I would need, I would either A, need the money, or B, you know, have something to put it into that would either do just as well, or I would get just as much of enjoyment from so, that's why I don't really know if I'll ever sell the set because, like, I don't plan on needing the money, and I don't know that I'll find something that you know is will sit better, you know, because I use those cards. I use them for my work. Right. So you're going into your work there. We haven't talked about it yet, but uh, you work for PSA, correct? As a consultant, part time. Yeah, as a part time contractor, we'll say. I'm on a yeah. I, I work as a contractor basically. <laughs> and because, I mean, I, I read the SMR magazine. I, I've seen your articles in there multiple times. You've, what is it, like four or five articles you've written so far? Is that right? Five. Yeah, five. five. Well, well I've, I've written, three of them have been published. Right. So there's, I've written five. Um, I just turned in the fifth as a final draft last month. Um, the Fourth one is going to be published in July. So Pharaoh Servant will come out in July. It's printed already. You're going to get it in a week. That's exciting. I'm excited. I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, They're already in the, in the mail. Yeah. So Pharaoh Servant is coming out. Uh, and then after Pharaoh Servant, um, what do, you, do you know what I did after that? You get, you get, take a guess. Well, I know you did the MRL one. I, I read that one. Yeah. Girl. Yeah. That, was, that was really good when had Ian in there and a few other people. Um, but no, what, where do you what are you hinting at? So I went. So I went, I didn't do Labyrinth the Nightmare. I decided that I wanted to write about Tournament Pack One and Two rather than Labyrinth the Nightmare because of the way that the sequence went for the sets. And so we did LOB. That was the San Diego Comic Con in 2019, and then March. May and now July. So March was Metal Raiders. May was Magic Ruler. July will be Pharaoh Servant. And then September will be TP1 and TP2. So um, there's an article that'll come out in September for TP1 and TP2. It's in word only. It's not in print um, yet, but they'll probably print it in August. I guess I gotta send them some cards to image so they can put pictures in there because I like the pictures. Pictures are nice. Okay, well, I'm excited of it. I'd, I'd love to hear about a little bit about TP1 and 2. Those very hard sets to even come by. Yeah. Let alone, um, getting I, I got some good quotes from Ian, who is a, a little bit older than me and has been involved a little bit longer than me and has a better recollection of some of the earlier days of tournament play. So. Uh, there's some good old school expert quotes in there, but we do PSA and I produce a PSA prints it. I, I help with the writing um, every other month. So every other month in perpetuity, there will be some kind of Yu-Gi-Oh article unless they come back and say, all right, we're good. We did enough Yu-Gi-Oh, you know, we need to have you do something else. So right. it plans are to produce articles every other month until I run out of articles to write. All right. Well, you guys heard that. Definitely get your episode or uh, sports episode. month and report. Yeah, there you go. go get it. And yeah. you get it free through PSA if you're, a, what is it, a platinum member, gold member? Gold member, I think, gets it too. Yeah. As long as you're a, a member, um, gold, platinum, whatever, silver, I think, I don't know. I, I'd have to read up on it. I'm a platinum member, so, and because I work for PSA, it's like a work expense, so. All right. Do they give you? A, you get any discounts working there? No. Nothing. You still they bring my cards just as hard as everyone else's, man. I was gonna Trust say, me, I get the same nines as Ethan Swanson is giving me the same nines that everyone else gets. That's what I was gonna say. I'm gonna send all my cards to you so you can go grade them for me. Maybe well, I'll have to yeah, <laughs> you you're gonna be disappointed. What well, you're gonna be dis <laughs> disappointed, man. Yeah, ask a bunch of people that grade through me, man. They grade just as hard as anyone else. Standard. <laughs> standard. They don't care whose name is on it. <laughs> Ethan uh, Swanson's still down at that QA desk, man. Trust me. Oh, man. So this is a question for myself mostly because I'm, I'm curious. Um, 
because you know for me being a, a huge collector i'm always trying to find stuff and i have a hard time finding certain items sometimes so i hit up other collectors that you know they're you know know where to find this rare stuff but what i'm hinting at is the question is um your rare items that you find where how do you acquire them like are you using a source a specific source are you certain websites um filtering give me an idea on how are you finding the rare stuff that you find that's the question um well here's my advice don't burn any bridges so you know talk to people, see what they're doing, you know, nine times out of 10, if you, you know, continue to maintain a re relationship with people in the community, you'd be surprised what people will tell you, what they find, what they have, um, you know, so I do a bunch of work, you know, it's mostly thankless work. I, I don't make very much on grading cards for people and stuff like that, but one of the perks of grading cards for people for almost nothing um, is that I get to see the cards that come back before they even get to my house. And so I have an opportunity to offer on the cards before they even get to whoever it is that graded them. Um, or, you know, if somebody orders something from another country and I bulk the items together so that it's cheaper to ship them um, and get them through customs, then um, I also get to see some of stuff like that. So, you know, it's mostly thankless work and, you know, the people on the other end are happy and, and I'm happy for them and I don't mind helping friends out and, you know, that kind of stuff because most of them are people that I would call my friends and stuff. And so uh, that, but that is part of it. I mean, I maintain relationships with people who are persona non grata in many circles. So, you know, all of these people that we talked about that are like on the fringe, people who like don't have a good relationship with most people in the community. Right. I keep a I keep a line out to these people, not because I'm manipulating them or anything, because I'm genuinely a nice guy and I like to stay in touch and I enjoy a, a communication um, as well because I'm an extrovert. But um, I uh, the byproduct of that is I get to see a lot of the cool stuff that they get sometimes. And so I find cards that otherwise would not be available um, or would be available and bought before I could find them. Find them like that. So, right. Well, that makes sense. I'm always, I'm always curious on that because it seems like you find some pretty rare stuff that, like, man, like, I feel like I haven't seen in years or, like, I'm still wanting that MFC poster, by the way, if you can find that. <laughs> I'll keep an eye out, man. I, I don't have any. Yeah, I just got a Pharaonic Guardian poster. There was a guy who posted two Pharaonic Guardian Legacy of Darkness Barrow Servant and two Labyrinth of Nightmare posters. You can't see it, but I have a Labyrinth of Nightmare poster on the back wall. So that's one of my favorite posters. I like purple. So. Well, most people know know me in the community. Know I'm obsessed with the posters lately. It's kind of my go-to thing. So <laughs> oh, I just I just I, love I heard about it. I heard about it. <laughs> it's uh it's pretty nostalgic. I can't wait to our next place. I'm gonna do a really cool room where all of them are hanged up, and that'll be a really cool sight to see when it happens. Yeah. Um. So I mean, we talked about a lot of different things of pretty excited about it. I appreciate you, um, you know, your knowledge on everything. Um, something that, uh, I feel like a lot of my, my viewers are a lot of new people to Yu-Gi-Oh. What would you say to, to someone just starting out in Yu-Gi-Oh who's starting to collect, to invest, where would they start? With them, with themselves. So know, know what you want to do. Um, I, I have this thing that I want to do. Um, on my YouTube, and you probably see the videos as they pop up. But you know, for me, it's the journey always starts in here first, right? So you start the journey inside, and you have to know what you want to do, right? What you what what do you want to collect? What do you like? Uh, what is it that you like? It, you know, buy that and enjoy the collecting, enjoy the experience, and then on top of that, you know, after you know what you want to do what you like, you try and determine what you want to do, right? So you know what you like, you determine what you want to do, and that becomes goal setting. So then you can say, okay, these are my goals, right? This is my collection goal. And stick to it. You have to stick to your collecting goals. Otherwise, things become chaotic. You know, the, the only reason that I've been able to amass, well, there's a couple, but the only reason that I could 
say relation to this is I've been able to amass all of this stuff. You know, the great collection is because it's a collection, right? I said that I'm going to collect 243 foils, man. And when I started that journey in 2018, like it took me all over the place, man. I mean, really, like I bought, I bought cards from all over the world, you know, to put these together. And I had to know all of these people to do it. Like I didn't do it in a vacuum. I didn't go to TCG player and buy all these cards and grade them myself. You know, I had to stay in touch with people. And so all these cards, they come from somewhere. They have a story. And that's the journey that comes with whatever your collecting goals are. Um, and so it might be, it might not be as long, right? It, it might be, you know, shorter, it, it might be smaller and whatever. That doesn't make it any less fulfilling, right? And the important thing when you collect is to enjoy the collecting. You don't oh, want to be a speculator. Those down. people, they're all about the money. Unfortunately, because I, uh, I hate that. Because I mean, don't get me wrong, I, I, I like having the rare, expensive stuff, but at the same time, I, I value there's certain things in my collection that I value more that aren't even worth that much, you know, and I always found that pretty interesting actually. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, that, that makes, that makes total sense. Just because that, something is rare doesn't mean that it can't be. Um, uh, uh, what's the word? It, I'll just say important to you. Right. So do, I, some people are, are of the opinion that everyone's a sinner, right? So everybody collects because they like the money. Everybody collects because they like rarity. Just because it's rare and valuable doesn't mean that it isn't sentimental in some form or another. So I like Dark Necrofear. My buddy always played Fiends and Classic, you know. And so I connect with those cards not because I played them, but because I played against them. So even though I have a 10 Necrofear and it's worth a lot, doesn't mean I like it because it's rare. I do appreciate it because I do appreciate rarity, but I also have a deeper connection to it in that sense. So it's not, it's not a single thing. So these things are not mutually exclusive. No, that makes sense. Like uh, I feel like when I pull a certain card, sometimes like and I grade it myself out, it's worth more to me because that experience that I had than you know if I went and bought the exact same card. You know, I, t I totally agree. So uh, for all the people who think that I just like the rare cards and valuable cards, nobody likes commons and rares more than me. I grade them and they're <laughs> worthless. Trust me. Maybe. Yeah, I always, I always found that funny. You always be great in the commons verse. But, I mean, completing those register sets, I mean, it, it makes sense. I mean, it does. It's tough, uh, man. It's tough. I'm try we're trying to get recognition around here, you know? Exactly. Um, the next section here, I'm going to ask you 10 questions, and okay. it's going to be very quick. Um, Lightning I'll, round. I'll, come again? Lightning round. Yeah. So it's like a lightning round. It's just off the top of your head. I'm going to ask you an either or, and you just tell me which one that you like out of the two uh, okay. choices. So it should be pretty pretty easy when we go. Sure. Um, so which one do you prefer, uh, Yugi or Kaiba? Man, Kaiba. Kaiba? Kaiba. Yeah, done. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> Bakura or Pegasus? Bakura, dude. Bakura? Nope. Gloss, glossy or wavy? Ooh. Well, these are quick, quick. Wavy, wavy. Blue wavy. eyes or red eyes? Blue eyes. Dark magician or dark magician girl? Dark magician. Prize card, Cyberstein or crush card virus? Cyberstein. Okay. Blister packs or booster packs? Blister packs. Buying or selling? Buying. Heck yeah. <laughs> IOC <laughs> or MFC? I IOC. IOC. PSA yeah. or BGS? PSA. Oh, you have to say that. <laughs> too easy. It's too easy, dude. It's too easy. And then eBay or Macari? Oh, wow. Uh, eBay. I, I just recently found Macari, so. Yeah, Macari's kind of sketchy. It's uh, it's got some good finds. I've, I've I've bought a couple things on there and got some good deals, and then I've also been scammed. Other with times, yeah, you don't get pack. anything at all. Yeah. Yeah, I, I don't know if you saw that video. I I got some uh, spell ruler packs that were glued shut. <laughs> the first dead ones. No, no, I didn't. Yeah, I saw the video. I didn't watch it. Yeah. No, yeah. that sucks, dude. I'm sorry. Yeah, dude. it was horrible. Luckily, they, I got my money back. But yeah, that was another subject. <laughs> so, 
Uh, yeah, Spell Ruler. And for everybody watching, Spell Ruler is not a fucking misprint. It's not a misprint. <laughs> you, heard it, that. you heard it from the man you're saying. Not a misprint. <laughs> Fight me in my DM on Instagram. <laughs> oh. So Spell Rulers aren't that rare then. It sounds like LOB no, might be. I don't conflict the two things. It could be rare, but it's not a misprint. <laughs> All of them are like that. All of them are like that. How could it be a misprint if they're all like that? All right. Man, I'll tell you what. I do want that box, though, that's on eBay, the first Ed Spell Ruler box. It's, hey, uh, I mean, seven grand's I mean, kind of out of the budget. Not, valuable, not rare, you know? Like, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it ain't a misprint. Everybody's like, oh, it's a misprint because it comes in a Spell Ruler pack and it says MRL and Spell. It's like they are all fucking like that. They all say that. <laughs> <laughs> they all say that. <laughs> all all um, say it. Man, oh man. Well, um, if anything, oh, uh, I do appreciate you being on the show uh, here, Gezi. Uh, guys, check out his Instagram, his YouTube channel, which very surprising for um, for your YouTube channel doesn't have as many subscribers as I would think. Yeah. I mean, but Don't worry uh, about I, it. it's okay. Content though wise, go check him out, guys. It's it's amazing. He pulled. I did see the LOB pack where you pulled two hollows. Was that wild? Real. That was pretty wild. Yeah. I saw that. I I, I had to watch the video more than once because I was like, "There's how? How that was that? real, dude? Like that was 100% real, dude. Like that's not like I didn't load that pack up and damage the cards, dude. I promise you. They they were double feed, double fed, and they were damaged 100%. <laughs> where did you um since we're on that subject where did you find that pack by the it way it belonged to it belonged to a friend actually um it belonged to my my buddy karma karma dear, uh lucas okay, i was gonna say lucas then yeah, I yeah thought lucas, lucas, lucas sent it over and he wanted to know it was real it was really heavy All right. like really heavy. so and yeah. because it had an extra part in it so. man that was you can't. You couldn't have asked for anything better than that. That was a great video, awesome video. Yeah. Your, your yeah. reaction was priceless too. So. <laughs> oh, I haven't watched it in a while. I always link it because I always like watch this shit, watch this shit. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, cool, man. Uh, if anything, uh, Gezi, aka Tony here. Uh, it's been fun, man. I've enjoyed interviewing with you. Um, I hope yeah. uh, people. Likewise. I hope uh, people have learned one thing or two, and. Uh, you know, hope, hoping it wasn't too boring for us, <laughs> for everybody. So, some of the, some of the, yeah, I think that who do you dislike the most in, in the Yu-Gi-Oh community? I think, think people will like that. Oh, yeah. It'll be, uh, I'm dying to see what the comments get, are going to be. <laughs> get hit up in my DM, man. People will be like, you said what about me? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, get real on, we get real on Prodigy's channel, man. <laughs> um but, uh, yeah, I appreciate the interview, man. Um, guys, keep checking out these interviews. I hope you're enjoying them as much as I'm having fun doing them. And until the next video, guys, Prodigy, I'll let you guys later. And the next one. Oh, Dark Necrofear. Oh, necro that is a huge pull, guys. Oh, my goodness. We're hoping to get red eyes, I know. blue eyes, of course. No, no, blue eyes. Oh, oh baby. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. Oh, First yes. edition. That's what we're talking what? about.